two in chapter two we're going to talk about organizing data now coming out of chapter one we put away quite a few definitions and terminologies we talked about the concept of population we talked about samples parameters and statistics and we uh, also considered some of the sampling techniques in chapter one now in chapter two the presumption is that let's say we have collected our data so the question might be so what am i going to do with this data that i have how can i organize this data so now the way we organize data it depends on the type of data that we have okay so before we actually look at our data types we need to talk about uh, variables so we'll talk about variables look at variable types and then the data types are defined by variable types so whatever the variable type is that determines the data type okay now let me tell you what I've done here which is different than my chapter 1 notes that were for most parts handwritten so because if I write it by hand it's gonna take me a long time and it wouldn't look as good so it's not like we're doing formulas you'll see we don't hardly have any formulas in this chapter at all if anything so our formulas are going to begin in chapter three when we look at summarizing summarizing data quantitative data that is so i thought it's best if i actually typed up uh, what i wanted to tell you and this way in case i forget something that is important you can actually read this and uh, you'll be able to hopefully maybe even to um, go back review take notes annotate whatever you, whatever it takes okay so uh, I think this is better for this chapter next chapters I will not do that I will actually do handwritten work or a combination of two but I think for this chapter it's best if I type them up so it's gonna look nicer and you can at least read it better than my handwriting so here we go so first of all let's define what a variable is and again I'm not gonna just read over this because I know you can read over it better than I could so I'm just gonna tell you uh, as much as I can if I skip something then you can uh, read actually what's on the screen and then pick up the things that I overlooked I have written all of this myself so it's not copy from a PowerPoint slide or anything so first let's talk about a variable so what is a variable a variable simply is the characteristic or the attribute that we are interested in I say under investigation so whatever trait or characteristic that we are interested in so for example the variable could be uh, the monthly rent at a certain location the size of a house the number of bedrooms the price of an automobile how many miles you drive in a day how many how far away from campus do you leave um, and uh, so on and so forth now typically we use the letter X just like they do in algebra classes uh, X to represent the variable but we could use descriptive variables so for example if I'm talking about height I may be looking at H for the variable if I'm looking at weight that could be W okay so now in broadly speaking there are two types of variables we have what's called quantitative and then we have qualitative variables okay now qualitative variables the name implies these are qualities so they are not quantities meaning they are not numbers they are more of again uh, characteristic these are qualities so for instance um, your religious affiliation that would be qualitative wouldn't it uh, the brand of automobile would be qualitative Honda uh, Ford Toyota these are all qualitative variables uh, name the person's name would be qualitative right it's just a label not a number a person's I have gender marital status and so on now quantitative variables by contrast these are actually numerical variables 
Now I have them as meaningful numerical vari uh, values here the meaningful numerical values for the variable. So what I mean by that is the following. For something that is not a meaningful numerical value. Okay, so let's say I'm talking about, for instance, zip codes. Now zip codes are numbers, aren't they? But for example, if a zip code is 92101, another zip code would be 74740. Of course, 92101 would be higher, but that doesn't really tell me necessarily that that zip code um, is any better than the other one. It's more of a label for a location, isn't it? A geographical location. It would be like the name for us. Okay, it will be kind of the same idea. It's just a, a label for a location for an address, a geographic region uh, in the U.S., when we talk about uh, telephone, for example, numbers or student IDs, there you go. My student ID is one 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 one. The other student ID would be five 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 five. So it doesn't mean that if I have a lower student ID, it, it's like you think any lesser than me about, uh, as opposed to another person or that relationship between. The lower ID, higher ID, it really doesn't mean anything. It's just, okay, it's just another substitute for our names. So that's what I mean by meaningful numerical numbers. Meaningful meaning you can actually do tangible uh, ar arithmetic on it, right? So for example, when we look at the age, a person who is 20 years of age, the other person is 25 years of age. So the second person is five years older, right, than the first one. That's meaningful number. Um, if you have cholesterol level of, let's say your LDL is 120, another person's LDL is 150, which is rather high, that means the second person again has a higher cholesterol level by in the tune of 30 units more so those are what we mean by meaningful numbers okay now coming out of this one okay now when it comes to quantitative variables quantitative variables are divided into two types or categories themselves we have what we call discrete and the other one is continuous Discrete variables are those where there's gap between numbers. Okay, there are usually counts and I have or finite values. They're not just limited to counts. Now by finite values meaning that they are a point on the number line. Okay, as opposed to continuous variables, these variables do not assume a point on the number line. They actually occupy a range or an interval on the number line. So for instance, let's say we look at this certain, let's say the box of a typical uh, parcel on a UPS truck. Uh, it could be anywhere from, let's say, if you're looking at the box, so it could be anywhere, let's say, from hypothetical one pound to 50 pounds. And any real number in there could, could, could be possible. So we don't have a specific point on the number line, okay? And the way to keep this, or, uh, this idea of discrete and continuous straight is to think about it this way. If you find yourself counting something, that variable is discrete. So, for example, the number of people who are going to be absent from the meeting, the number of people that show up to, uh, to a birthday, uh, the number of anything that's a number of whatever okay now with um, continuous variables typically these are measured so if you find yourself measuring something literally measuring something then that variable is um, continuous okay all right so for example how far again you live from campus that's going to be a measured quantity. You're going to say, well, I live one mile away, a mile away. Well, you don't really, 
if you measured it, it wouldn't be exactly one mile, would it? If I could actually measure accurately enough, you're just rounding that number. We could actually go and go down to really specific um, lots of digits beyond it and convert it into centimeters, millimeters, and so on and so forth. So you get the idea that this thing is going to be uh, a measured quantity. And of course, it will assume a value that's uh, inside an interval. So let's take a look at now a summary of what we just talked about. So we have variables we divide them into two groups on the left I have quantitative variables and to the right we have qualitative variables now quantitative variables are further divided into two subcategories we have continuous on the left and discrete on the right side remember discrete are counts gaps between numbers specific point discrete points on the number line Whereas continuous, you don't have a specific point. You have values inside of an interval. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Now, we're about to go to the next section. Sorry, this thing was uh, stuck on whatever it was. Now, in this chapter, we would like to be able to organize our data. And uh, how we organize the data depends on the uh, variable type remember the variable type determines the data type so for example if my variable is quantitative then my data that I collect would be quantitative data if my variable is qualitative then the data that I collect will also be qualitative okay now um, let's see so let's take a look at section 2.2 now displaying and organizing qualitative data now of the two data types by the way qualitative quantitative we really prefer quantitative data types okay and the reason is because remember for qualitative these are labels for most parts there's not much you can do with qualitative data best you can do is uh, use displays and do a graphical display of them the formulas do not work with qualitative data okay so that's why we do not like to have qualitative information but it's not bad it's just we prefer to have other types that are quantitative sorry I'm playing around with this as I'm talking so I'm trying to make it to where you can see better <clears throat> okay now um, so in this section let's take a look at how are we going to organize qualitative data? So I've made up a bunch of numbers here. Actually, uh, this is, let's say, these are um, exam on uh, a statistics exam in one of the courses for one of the instructors. Okay. And um, notice that the data collected are literal uh, such as A, B, C, D, like they're letters of the alphabet. So these are not numbers. However, an A is higher than a B, B higher than a C, and so forth, right? Therefore, this is actually uh, a stronger case of qualitative data. We have two types of qualitative data, nominal and ordinal. With nominal, that's like the lowest data type that you have. Nominals are labels. Like, for example, a person's name, Jeff versus Joe, other than uh, alphabetical order. Uh, even if we do alphabetically sort uh, last names, typically on a roster that we receive, all the students are listed in alphabetical order. But the order really doesn't mean much, right? A person whose last name begins with a B versus someone whose last name begins with a W right it doesn't mean the b person who's the person whose last name begins with b is one in one fa in one way or another um better higher lower than the other person so order simply doesn't make sense however with letter grades in this case because we know an a is a higher grade so order makes a difference therefore we call this qualitative data 
ordinal ordinal data now let's say i have this data but whether it's nominal or ordinal those are both qualitative so what we are about to do we can do with both of them <clears throat> now in other words i can do this with eye colors i can do this with hair colors with person's name and so on so in this section we're going to look at frequency distribution relative frequency distribution by charts and, uh, pie charts and bar charts now everything we do in this chapter in the way of graphical displays the ones that are bulleted we will be able to do in stat crunch so actually after i'm done with this lecture we will go to stat crunch and we'll try to generate some of this uh, graphical displays that you're looking at okay now let's take a look at frequency and relative frequency distributions first of all now the data that is up here okay and uh, which data are we talking about i'm talking about that data okay the data that is up there so for this data i went ahead and grouped them so i have first column grades a b c d f and then i have the frequency or counts of each letter grade in the next column the middle the second column right i'm looking at this column okay those are the counts frequencies and we use the lowercase f for that okay now next to that i have relative frequencies now if you just look at grays and frequencies just that those two columns then what we're looking at is a frequency distribution now once you add the second or actually this will be the third column right to the second column now my table has three columns then we are looking at a relative frequency okay so the frequency distribution simply shows the distribution of the values of the variable so in this case i have five a's four b's six c's and so on okay now if i look at the relative frequencies the, the word relative here means relative to the total relative to the total so every individual frequency is divided by the total frequencies and that's what makes it relative okay so 5 out of 20 means 25 percent in decimal that's 0.25 notice we can write that three ways right and uh, the next category uh, let's say B I have 20 percent B's 30 percent C's 10 percent failed 15 percent also failed because D is not passing hypothetically and notice the total the frequency column total this total should equal to your sample size and the other total as a decimal should add up to one or it has to add up to a hundred percent okay now one thing I can do right off the bat with this frequency and relative frequency distribution I can say that 5 out of 20 students let's say this was my class I can say 5 out of 20 students actually get an A in the class that's 25 percent now rather than saying that 5 out of 20 get an A in the class we rather talk in percentages so I'm gonna say well 25 percent of the students get A See, we can relate to percentages much better than the, the absolute numbers okay and um, i have something i have written about this in a few moments i just don't want to show you the whole page this way i just scroll it a little bit at a time i can say that 10 percent of the students or actually 25 percent right of the students failed the course okay or i can say one in four i can say four in um let's say 20 percent uh, four in 16 that's 25 percent yeah 25 percent here so i can say four and 16. so instead of again using absolute numbers um i can sort 25 out of 100. we try to stay with percentages and these will lend themselves nicely to probability later on we'll see there is a connection with mean between probability and um, relative frequencies I have a whole bunch of stuff here you can read this uh, maybe pause the video and read it 
right? So you don't have to listen to me and read at the same time. Whatever works for you. But again, the reason I'm doing this is because the important stuff I wanted, I, I typed it in, I wanted you to know, and then I said, well, I'm just going to talk about it. They can read the other details I have. Okay. And so anyway, uh, that's the kind of work we're going to look at. And that's what we do with relative frequencies. And that's what they're used for. Now, the next few uh, displays are uh, visual displays, graphical displays. So this one, I'm sure almost all of you have seen, heard, or have done yourself these pie charts, right? You have seen it. You've talked about it. And maybe, again, constructed one yourself. So this is an example of what we call a pie chart all right now this is the pie chart for the data that i had see up here remember i had 25 20 30 15 10 percent there they are 25 20 30 15 10. i actually did this pie chart in um what you call it in stat crunch the software that comes with your textbook okay that's why i picked my matlab for this course primarily was a stat crunch because the stat crunch is really really important in our work okay and what do we get out of a pie chart well remember the pie represents the whole right that represents the whole 100 percent each slice looks at the contribution to the total so for example if you look at a slice that's one quarter almost 25 percent of grades of a student's in the sample uh, earned an A. Notice the way StatCrunch does this. It displays the letter grade, the count, and the percentages. Okay, so we can actually uh, do this. Now, I'm going to just write this down because when we go to StatCrunch, I'm going to show you how we can actually do this in StatCrunch. Okay. And there you go next we're going to look at our bar charts this would be this was a pie chart and our next graphical display is going to be a bar chart now a bar chart is kind of like a pie chart well i'm sorry not like a pie chart because pie charts are <laughs> circular these are bars but th what i meant is that it is like a pie chart not in shape but in what it imparts what it tells us okay now, it's just a different way of displaying data. Remember, the whole idea is I have a bunch of numbers. How do I impart the information? So we're just showing you different ways you can display that information. There's not a right or wrong way of doing this. Okay. Now, here's a bar chart of grades. A, B, C, D, F. So I have five A's, four B's, six C's. 3Ds, 2Fs. So again, it gives me exact same information as the uh, frequency distribution did, as the relative frequency distribution did also. Okay, it's just another way of portraying that information. Now, let's take a look at, and this is actually in descending orders from A to F. Now you can look at the relative frequency. Let me sh um, lower this and zoom it down. Okay. Now if you look at actually these two, if you look at the two bar charts I have, one is frequency. Okay. The one on top is frequencies. This one. The other one is percents or relative frequencies. Remember, relative frequencies are decimals and percents. If you look at the bars and if you look at the overall charts, they really look the same, don't they? Um, the only difference is um, instead of, again, frequencies or counts, you're looking at percentages. So, for instance, let's say I have two out of however many uh, I had uh, God Fs. This one says 10% God Fs. So, it really, they, again give you the same kind of information okay now again in practice we would like to have relative frequencies not uh, frequencies this is a bar chart of grades it's the same thing only order differently now look at this one 
I'm going in ascending orders by count of the letter grades. F D B A C. Oh, actually, oh, I see. This is in ascending order by count. See that? And you can see it's going by count. That's where it's going. So you wouldn't expect for this to be F D C B A. It's not in the order by grade. Okay, it's ordered by count. So that means the lowest count first, the highest count next. Just another way to show this. Again, this has its own merits. I can say, ah, it looks like a majority of students got C in that, on that exam. Next to that, most people got A's. So on and so forth. And, and this one is in descending. The other one was ascending. This is descending order by count. And again, they both, all of these, all one, two, three, four part charts give me exact same information. Okay, it's just a matter of how you want to present this information. And let me now enlarge this back to where I had it. And let's see, there you go. Okay. Sorry, I'm scrolling. I know it's probably making you dizzy, isn't it? Zoom. Let's actually do this. Okay, so we talked about these bar charts. Now, uh, let's take a look at section 2.3. In section 2.3, you're going to see, okay, how am I going to display or organize quantitative data now? We know how to do qualitative. What about quantitative? Now, something that's interesting, folks, anything you do with qualitative data, whether you analyze or display them, you can do it with quantitative data because you can create categories from quantitative data as I have here. And then once you create categories from them, and these are the categories I'm talking about, once you create categories, then you are going to treat them just like they are qualitative data you see that now they become like that so that's what i mean anything you do with qualitative data you can also do with quantitative data so same information except now in order to do because i need quantitative means i actually have to have numbers so i went ahead and give you the numbers instead of the letters now, of course that's not a c that's not a d they don't go in the order that you see in the list up there Okay, so the original scores uh, are not exactly the same. Like, for example, look at that one 92B, F is 98, whatever that is. That's not, that's not how this data works. They're all there, it's just they're in different order. Okay, now uh, the variable score here is what we're looking at, analyzing it, <coughs> it is quantitative. So what I've done is created a range of scores, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, and so on. Below 60 would be F. And I got exactly, remember, I'm starting with these now, not with the one above it. But I'm getting exactly the same information as I got earlier. Just to show you that we can do anything with quantitative. Um, we can do... Anything we do with qualitative data, qualitative data, we can do with quantitative data. Okay. Uh, so, the two that we just uh, passed through, pie charts and bar charts, are very common. A lot of financial newspapers, magazines, and things like that, they usually display these. But we're actually going to look at uh, more exciting charts. Okay. So we're going to look at histograms, and then these are statistical charts we're going to look at. Dot plots, stem and leaf, and the fancy ones are box plots and QQ plots. Unless you've had statistics, you probably haven't heard or done the last four. Most of you have seen pie charts, bar charts, histograms. But again, unless you had statistics before, these last four you have not had or seen it. So let's begin with histograms again. Histogram is kind of like a bar chart, except it's for quantitative data. Notice the numbers near the bottom. These are all quantitative information. 30, 40, 50, and so on. So, <clears throat> 
a histogram uh, actually is used to show the distribution of the values for the variable how do the data distribute and usually what we do which i haven't done for this let me show you something i can do if i look at the midpoints of these bars you see i'm choosing the midpoints and then we can connect them and notice by the way this is a bad thing in a histogram we don't want empty classes because that causes a discontinuity or disruption in our data display now this thing is kind of sitting up in the air let me anchor it down so hypothetical if i had a category it would be there and the next one would be here and there you go this is what this histogram shows now uh, let me show you actually something different now so instead of making these kind of like straight line segments like this what we do is we smooth over these bars okay in a histogram now you can just do it in your mind in your imagination like that right and this would be the shape of that histo histogram now we can actually modify that shape and kind of do this now right and if i move away uh, this is going to look cool ah i know i messed it up but if i move it away you see what i see so when i see this histogram actually this is what comes to my mind i don't look at individual bars i look at the overall trend okay so that's that's what we would like to do we would like to actually look at how the data is trending well we do need the bars in order to draw the curve okay now um as far as histograms go we look for several things in the histogram one thing we look at notice i have this is a skew to the left so we look for symmetry or skewness in a histogram okay so this is what we mean is the distribution like that that's the skew to the left this is the skew to the right and this would be kind of symmetric distribution so this is the kind of things we look at okay i'll show you these later on okay but for now this is what we want to look at so let me actually clean this up a little bit okay and <clears throat> this is what i want to show now um, so if the distribution is skewed to the right this is what the distribution looks like for a distribution that is skewed to the right this one we're going to call it uh, skewed to the right or simply a right skewed distribution so i'm calling it positively skewed because if you think of a number line that's like in the positive direction right uh, and then we're going to look at the other form of the distribution in a histogram we'll look at something that may look like that that this one is a skew to the left so it is a left skew distribution and finally we could have a symmetric distribution some of you may recognize that distribution here's the center this is a symmetric distribution now we could have several kinds of symmetric distribution this distribution is symmetric about the center uh, this distribution is symmetric check this out uh, let's say there you go it's just a constant uh, like that and here we go this is what the histogram looks like so this one is symmetric too there you go there's the center it could be symmetric and triangular so just when we say symmetric we don't necessarily mean this one okay it could be symmetric in a number of ways let me remove these but uh, later on we tend to just look at the three that i have just drawn for you so keep in mind this is one thing the key thing that we look at um, the key item that we look for in a histogram it's the shape of the data okay the shape of our data 
The other thing histograms are used for are outliers. So for example, I can say that this is an outlier. Notice only one person uh, got a score less than 40. The rest of them got more than 50. So I can call this person an outlier. Okay. And uh, we talk about outliers later. Outliers are those that really are away from the, the trend. That's what they are. So we look at for extreme values, either low or high. And we also look at outliers. But remember, in general, we look for trend. The three things I have here, those are the trend that we are looking at. And here I have, uh, as a rule of thumb, like how many bars in a histogram? Well, we go any anywhere from 5 to 15. Remember, we would like to avoid this if we can. We don't like gaps in the histograms. Okay. And we're not going to do this by hand. Okay. All of these displays, you can use StatCrunch on the homework and also on the exams. But I have some guidelines here on actually how to construct histograms you can notice none of these i'm showing you how to do them by hand these are more of guidelines it means the set of uh like think of it as advice guidelines are like advice or hints on how to do things Oops, sorry not sure what happened there okay so that's what we we're doing with this guidelines let me just go bold italic or just bold underline now, these classes must be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Mutually exclusive means the classes do not overlap. So if I have a score of 82 or 80, for example, you should put me in a B. You cannot put me also in like a C plus category. So in that sense, your mutually exclusive means disjoint classes. Collectively exhaustive means everybody is going to be counted for. Okay. Avoid empty classes because you saw what happens with empty classes. Empty classes, you're going to have discontinuities or breaks in the graph and we don't like that. Use equal class width when possible. When we later on connect these relative frequencies to probability histograms, then that becomes important. Okay, if you don't use equal class widths, then that's going to be difficult to work it in terms of probability distributions and so on and so forth. Now, let's see. Um, ch -ch -ch -ch. The rest of these are okay. Uh, let's see. Let me actually move this a little bit higher. Okay, I did. I, I just moved this paragraph a little bit higher, this one. Okay, now, so, uh, one, one thing I want to mention, or something I should mention about histograms, uh, because there is no set rule that says how many bars you should use, so a histogram that is constructed using, let me go back up here, this is a histogram. I use one, two, three, four, five, six bars here, right? If I had used three bars, I would get a different shape, the different impression of the chart. So uh, you got to be really careful with histograms. Okay, uh, the number of bars actually determine the shape of the histogram. So they could be misleading. Okay, they could be very misleading and they could be manipulated. Okay, the other thing is that with histograms, they confound information. Okay, so for example, this is what I mean by confounding, mean hiding information. How are they hiding information here? Well, look at, for example, 70 to 80 category. I have no idea what those six scores are, right? The six scores in that category. And these are six scores up there. So they could be all 75s, all six of them. One of them could be 72 and then the other four could be 79, right? We don't know. That's what we mean by confounding. Confounding means hiding. So, but it is what it is. And we are aware of it. It's just, it's not illegal or anything bad. It's just, you got to be really careful. So, how do we get around this confounding issue? Uh, well, there are other statistical charts, such as 
there you go let's say dot plots a dot plot is like a histogram the difference is that it actually uses every single data point to show the di or display the information notice again this one person sticks out the score of 30 whatever that was just maybe 32 34 it's away from the rest of the group so even in dot plots we can identify outliers okay liars and we look for the same thing now with small samples your dot plots don't look that impressive so we really stay with histograms one thing that dot plots are good for because they use every data point is that we can actually look at the spread of data points much better in a dot plot than we can in a histogram you see how this spread out and suppose the average score is i don't know 70 something now i can look at the spread of each of these scores relative to the center so that's what this is good for and just by itself i can see this data is spread out look at for example a dot plot that may look like this see this dot plot it is not as scattered as the one you're looking at right so this one has lesser of a dispersion than the one you're looking at or even with this one let's say i'm going to make up another dot plot let's say this is one exam in one class and then they're in another class maybe the scores look like this you see that so the scores are more spread out for this class the exam scores are more spread out they have higher dispersion or variation than this group of data do they're not as a spread out so things like that um, we look for in a dot plot also okay and check out this dot plot as the sample size increases the dot plots not only show the spread they also become more like a histogram don't they so these are let's say i have these are exams on a biology exam this is for a large university and a, a large section with 160 exam scores now look at the symmetry in this distribution see that's kind of what we look at when we look at these dot plots we don't look at individual dots um, we look at collective dots what kind of a trend does the data exhibit that's what we look at okay so there you have this one actually uh, maybe i will leave that curve on there there that looks nice <laughs> okay now the next kind of statistical chart we're going to look at is called a stem and leaf a stem and leaf again this is something that was developed by late professor tukey uh, of princeton university and i have him right in here and he really contributed a lot to the field of statistics and also engineering okay and also computer sciences in fact the words bit and digit um or i'm sorry not digit but uh bit and byte are um coined by and they were coined by professor tukey Professor Tukey again of Princeton University he contributed a lot in the area of exploratory data analysis uh, or EDA exploratory data analysis where you explore your data in visual terms so he did contribute quite a bit and uh, so anyway and what does this system and if look like and there you go now again remember you don't have to do this by hand we get this from software that's why when you paid for that access code whatever you pay uh, it's gonna be trust me it's gonna pay for itself and then some now check out the stem and leaf here the idea behind the stem and leaf was this professor Tukey said or thought I can break any number into two parts 
I can break it into a stem and then a leaf. So with these numbers, these are the stem values. Okay. And it's not the new stem that you hear in, in our campuses. You know, like you have your STEM major, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. <laughs> this is a STEM, more a STEM like on a tree. You have a stem and then you have the leaves on the tree. So those are the stem values and these to the right of it are the leaf values. So those are the leaves, if you will. So you got your stem values, you got the leaf values. So for example, the score of 35, score of 35 is going to be the score, the very first one. Now look at something. Um, we can actually have what we call unordered and then we can have ordered stem and leaf. Usually we look at ordered, not unordered. But interestingly, the shape of both look the same, right? Uh, it's just the standing of the digits. So if you look at, for example, in here, look at the leaf values. Sorry, this one. Look at those. They're the same six leaf values, but they are ordered from low to high on the right side. And in the left, on the left side, they have their natural ordering, the way they appear in the data. So our preference is on ordered now good information about this stem and leaf for one thing i know the minimum score was 35 the maximum score is 99 there you go that's what the advantage is and other than minimum and maximum of your data you can again look at the shape of this distribution so those are the things that we look for and uh, there you have it so to me stem and leaf is like a histogram that is rotated 90 degrees isn't it imagine if we rotate this histogram in that direction so this is horizontal your three is here nine is here as i rotate it it's gonna uh, look like this isn't it so it is like a histogram on its side okay that is rotated so those are the things again we look for in a stem and leaf you all you always look for outliers you can look at trends and so on okay and then of course you can you can read uh, read what i have i kind of talked about most of these now one thing that i have here let's say for large data one drawback of a stem and leaf is this because just like a dot plot see stem and leaf uses every single data point so imagine if i have 1000 data points so i'm gonna have 1000 numbers here that's just gonna be a lot of information on one page isn't it so the stem and leaf does have its limitation and and because of um, what I just mentioned for a stem and leaf, therefore, what we can do is we can, if the line, the stem lines get to be too long, we can actually break them off into multiple lines per stem. Okay, so what I mean here, let's say I'm just making this up. Suppose I have my stem is six and the leaf numbers are zero, zero, one, two, th two, three, six, seven seven eight nine 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 like that right well that's just let's say too long of a line i can break this into two lines per stem so i'm going to go digits zero through five and one line and then six through nine and uh, five nines right one two three four five there so we can actually break these in case of very long lines still you just break them further again so i could have three lines per stem four lines per stem nine lines ten lines per stem okay so there are corrective actions we can take with those but then again we're just going to leave it up to 
our software in order to do this. Now, sometimes we use what we call back to back stem and leaf. The back to back, the idea of back to back is to compare two groups. So, for example, look at the distribution in this group and look at the distribution in this group, kind of totally opposite, right? Uh, here's a female, there's male. Okay. So these are distribution of weights in pounds between the group of male and female. That's what these are. So you got female weights, you got male weights in this case. And you can kind of see um, the stem is 1, 2. And what does 1, 2, 9, 8 in this way means? That means that's 128. The other one is 129 pounds. Okay what does this row of the stem and leaf tell me well to the right the scores are 166 pounds 166 pounds 168 I got three of those because there are three eights right so simply attach the leaf to the stem and you get the scores for females in that uh, weight category I have 160 that's this one 163 that's this one 165 that would be this one and 167 which is this one you see how that works so that's the significance of these stem and leaves it just puts two distributions literally back to back <laughs> okay and you're almost done with this <clears throat> now one thing I want to talk about again I kind of mentioned this earlier in passing but I call it the pitfall of small samples now this is true as we go forward in anything we do with small samples nothing we do looks good the displays don't look that impressive histograms will have maybe short bars out of whack many gaps or empty classes and the dot plots don't look meaningful at all the stem and leaf doesn't look good there doesn't really exhibit a pattern and even with statistical analyses let's say the mean median mode stuff like that they really aren't accurate and they are not meaningful although we can do those but they're simply not meaningful okay so that's what my pitfall of small samples is that's what i'm trying to to uh mention so be careful with small samples we really uh, aren't really too thrilled with small samples now large samples we love when it comes to sample size the more the merrier the better okay and as the sample size grows, by the way, everything looks much better. Okay, much, much better. Now, <clears throat> um, what I have here now is actually distribution shapes. I kind of mentioned about this. Let me again move this higher. This is live as I'm creating this notebook. <clears throat> okay. Now, what do we mean by distribution shapes? I already mentioned it. So when it comes to shape of distributions, we're looking for three shapes in general. So we're looking for skewness. Okay, so this is the shape we're looking at. And this is an example of left skewed distribution. Some call it negatively skewed. Okay. The other thing we look when it comes look for when it comes to the shape of the distribution would be a symmetric distribution. Is there a symmetry? So this would be a symmetric distribution. Okay, so first one is left skewed, the second one is symmetric. And it means neither skew to the left nor right. We could have skewness in the right. This would be a positive skewness. Okay, so we're going to call that a right skewed distribution. 
okay so that's what we're looking at for the shape of these distributions they may not look exactly like it but uh, again an impression of it so for example my symmetric distribution may look like that even uh, that's almost symmetric you see that uh, right skew distribution let's say I draw my histogram and it's gonna look like this and there you go that's gonna be right skewed left skew distributions may look like so I have this one and then I have this one this one and this one da, da, da. and then that cool and there you have it left symmetric and right skew distributions and that's all there is in that section so i'm going to stop here now and i'm going to go to stat crunch so let me pause this and then i'm going to bring up uh, stat crunch now i'm going to go to my math lab all right so i'm in my math lab okay and i just grab one of my statistics classes don't worry about if this is in your class it doesn't matter because i just want to go to the software but um, this is my math lab and the way to go to stat crunch there you go so I'm in my main page on the left pane we're looking at stat crunch so click on stat crunch and there are a couple of ways you can open stat crunch you can view the data set from your textbooks or you go to stat crunch website now my personal experience is um, for me i like to go to data sets from your textbook because when you do that let me click on it it will do that it will actually import all the data sets from the textbook so they're all in here on the left side you see this i have chapter two chapter three four well, there's nothing to see these these are hot links these are not links there are no links here it means chapter four and five you're on your own no stat crunch but look at all the other chapters except chapter 12 again there is no data set doesn't mean stat crunch cannot help us it's just there are no data sets so let me correct myself this doesn't mean that there is no stat crunch it means just there are no data sets to import so for example we're in chapter two you click on this and these are all the exercises in chapter two that one way or another have data associated with them okay now i'm just going to click on one of these at random let's see if that's going to be a good one and there you go so here's actually the data that's imported looks like gender and age so we have two variables right now age is numerical value and these are genuine numbers right these are not like zip codes social security or ids that are meaningless so these are actually good numbers so age is quantitative uh, the person's sex or gender is going to be qualitative right quality male male female notice there are no numbers associated with these these are literal uh, letters right of alphabet so that makes variable sex uh, nominal actually qualitative age is going to be quantitative now uh, before I actually, since we are in Stat Crunch and you haven't seen Stat Crunch yet, so ladies and gentlemen, I like to introduce a Stat Crunch. Stat Crunch is your best friend. Okay, so I want to introduce you your best friend throughout the semester. It really is going to make your lives so much easier, and this is where you're getting your money's worth for the access code. Every penny of it is going to be worth it okay especially since i allow you to use it so i'm not gonna uh put a damper on things and spoil it for you okay so having said that let me show you how this works let's say um i want to introduce first of all as we go through i'll show you more and more features of stat crunch the parts that we need okay but uh right now we're just doing stat uh graphical displays right so here's you go on graph tab and i'm not clicking i just move the mouse over it and you're gonna see these look at all the charts that are available so we just talked about a very selective list of these right not all of them 
Now remember, not all of these can be used with nominal data or qualitative data, but we're going to actually do this. I'm going to go to a pie chart. I'm just sliding the mouse. I'm not clicking anything because you can see the hand here, right? I'm not clicking. And then I'm going to slide with the other two options here. So I'm going to create a pie chart with data, not summary, with data. The with data option you choose when you actually see your data. See, I actually see my data. So I'm going to choose a pie chart with data. Click. Now select the columns. Now I just want to do a pie chart. Remember, we do pie charts for qualitative variables, not quantitative. If I do a pie chart of these, it's going to be so strange looking. There's going to be a slice for every single number. Okay. Let me show you a meaningless, a meaningless pie chart. There you go. Okay. So in this pie chart, uh, looks like I have uh, three eighteens, ten nineteens, seven twenties, and so forth. We don't like pie charts like this. Oops, sorry, it's out of, out of the boundary. There you go. It was outside the viewing window. So there you go. That is a pie chart of the age. I mean, it's still not bad. It's just you, can, you see, that's not a good pie chart. It's too crowded. But you can see, for example, one person was forty-four, one was forty-two. Imagine if I had a thousand scores so this is going to be um it's going to have a lot of slices okay so let's take a look at oh something interesting happened i'll catch that on the next run so i'm going to do a pie chart with data this time i'm going to actually do it with uh gender or sex and all you got to do is left click once not double click so whether you left click or double click doesn't matter now if I left click age it brings that one if I pick if I want to pick both of them let me enlarge this for you so you can see it reads see I'm over here it reads to see when I hold it over the variable look at what is being read down here in highlights if you want to select more than one variable, you have to do shift click or control click. So now I'm going to hold the control button on my keyboard and click on sex. And there you go. Now both of those are on the right side. These become our analysis variables. Sitting on the left side, they're just variables. They're just sitting there. Once you move them over here, here and on the right side, they're going to become analyzed. Now remember, I don't want a pie chart of age, so I'm just going to uh, control and click. Uh, actually, age. Oh, actually, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Let me do that again. So I'm going to control, click on age, bring it in. Now, if you don't want age, go back here, control, age and it will remove age from the right side okay now you can kind of read all of these and play around with it i just take the defaults of what stat crunch gave me but you can display counts percent totals okay if you want you can only display counts if you want you can display percentage of total only the one I showed you actually had both counts and percents. So I'm going to control, hold the control on the keyboard and left click at the same time once. <clears throat> now we have both of those displayed for every slice. Hmm. Okay. Now you can order by however you want count ascending count descending value ascending value descending and the start angle you can this allows you to rotate okay and then you can choose your colors and so on you can just play around with these right i'm not interested in all the details just hit compute and, and there you go this is actually going to be a display of your uh, gender 
So it looks like major majority of uh, people in the sample are females. 28, that's for 56 percent of the sample. See how easy it is to do a pie chart? Now if I want to rotate, let me just show you the rotate. I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees. So this line you see here, 90 degrees rotated, it's going to move almost uh, right in here. So my red slice is going to begin right about here, about kind of six o'clock, right? I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. Oh, if you want to edit any attribute, you go to options. Now look at your options here. You can edit the chart. If you want, you can save it. It will save it to a desktop or the, uh, as a dr hard drive, flash drive, whatever. You can copy and paste it into a Word document. Okay, so let's say I'm going to open a Word document here. Uh, I'm going to go Control New. Okay. And let me go back here. I'm going to go Options, Copy. Now, remember, I have my Word document open. <laughs> and I'm not doing anything. I just left the mouse over where you see in the blue area. There is a tip. It reads right-click the image and select copy image or copy. <clears throat> so I'm going to right click and there you go. Copy image. That's what it says, right? It says copy image or copy. I don't see copy. I see copy image. I did. There. So this is kind of now on the clipboard. To paste it into Word or PowerPoint, choose paste special. It means control alt V, not just control v usually control v pastes it for st for stat crunch it's programmed to do control alt v for special paste okay and paste as either device independent or bitmap so i'm going to do that remember control alt v so i'm going to go to word control alt hold in and v and it's going to ask me do you want device independent bitmap html format bit bitmap you can try whatever you want i'm going to go bitmap and, and look at the paste link so you can try those i just want to paste it i don't want to paste the link and there it is this is now in my word document so now you can do anything you do in word you can do with this so you just type blah 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 whatever this is whatever and you can make a report and make your reports look nice. So all of the outputs from StatCrunch can be done this way. Let me close this one. Don't save. Okay, and let me close this now. Now I'm going to X this out. Oh, I didn't rotate it, did I? Let me rotate it. Okay, I'm going to go edit. But so anyway, you can see, you can download this, refresh. If you want, delete it. I'm going to edit it. And I just want to start angle. I'm going to go 90 degrees and look at this. Oh, <clears throat> it was 90 degrees. What it did, it rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise. It moved it to the left. Okay. So if I wanted to do what I thought it would do, let me rotate it. I'm going to go options edit. I've never tried this. I'm going to go negative 90. This is going to rotate it clockwise. Oh, nope didn't like it okay 0 to 360 so let me go I'm gonna go 180 degrees rotation boom there you go so we can just uh, mess around with this now I'm gonna X this out but look what happens to this whole output when I exit out okay do you see the effect it kind of shrunk and then it moved right in here didn't it notice the two in here that I have that means there are two outputs so far so there you go remember I did a pie chart for age that was I said meaningless and a pie chart for sex so this is your session output so anything you do in this session so if I create 50 graphs this is going to go 50 and I have access to every one of them you can recall them look at this let's say well let me bring back and you don't click on it if you click it goes away click in click out 
click in and just slide don't click and then slide show all there you go these are the two right that I had and look, look how look good it looks and look how easy it is if you want remember click and slide you can delete delete all of them delete what's showing delete what's hidden I'm gonna go delete hidden are you sure yeah that's fine and look there's nothing there now okay so anyway we'll look at some of these later on but for this course primarily for chapter one or well, chapter two that we are in this is where you are in future chapters three and beyond we're going to spend most of our time check this out in the statistics tab and there you go see all of the good stuff is in here that's why we need quantitative data okay all of these just about and everything here requires all of these require you have quant quantitative data not qualitative quantitative okay now let's do the other charts we talked about we did histogram oh, okay bar chart let's do a bar plot remember bar charts are for qualitative data with data for sex compute and there you go if you hold the mouse over the bar it gives you information 28 females hold the mouse don't click just slide you get 22 okay so it looks like again more females than males that's what the pie chart told us it's just a different way of displaying information and the session output is in here now now here's what I want to show you this is interesting let's say you want to you need help in anything that we do anything in here now we're not going to do all of these we're doing a bar plot pie chart histogram stem and leaf box plot dot plots later we do scatter plots but we don't do bubble plots means plots we do QQ plots you don't do index time plots pairs plots parallel coordinates stars plots 3d and stuff we don't do these Ooh, map US map if you want select variable in but see it doesn't make sense if I use US map with age look at this it's gonna or sex let's see <laughs> error select at least one value so anyway US map we are not gonna use that okay so here's what I was gonna say let's say I'm in here and I need help with any one of these check out this help now look at this help I'm not again clicking you get several options near the bottom you need help with keyboard shortcuts some people like to use keyboard shortcuts like you know alt e control x control v control a things like that so it shows you the keyboard shortcuts okay and there you go so if you want to do edit menu control alt e everything is control alt you want you want a stat menu you control alt s control alt g for graph control alt h for help and anyway I don't use those now here's the other help contact support when things go really south it takes you to Pearson support and there you go you just follow the prompts and that's what that one is let me X out help this next help YouTube videos let me click on YouTube videos and this isn't me by the way this is what you call it this is a stat crunch and look at this one now this is all the YouTube videos with stat crunch check this out to the right stat crunch getting started getting started short version full version creating simple bar plot bar plots with summary and look at everything that you have guys check this out see you don't need me for this do you let me actually move the viewing window to the right there so look at this everything that you need to practice on is right in here so please if you need help 
one way ANOVA, linear regression, graphical calculators, and so on and so forth. And these are all short videos. Look at the length of each of these. They try to keep them under five minutes. Look at that. Box plots, scatter plots, univariate statistics. And there you go. Look at that. They've got tens. They try to keep it below 100, looks like. Okay. So, this is an option. If you want to try these, by all means do. Uh, let me click on a short one, maybe. There you go, frequency tables. And it actually goes to YouTube, and it's going to play YouTube now. In this video, you will learn to create frequency tables using StatMatch. The data set I am using is called two categorical variables. This is just a toy data set that contains two columns of data. In this video, I will focus on the var1 column that contains 10 values. For the values of notice a, I fast forwarded it and also notice this is closed caption. If you want, you can turn it off. Turn it on by clicking on CC. Under the options menu, choose edit. This takes us back to the original window where we built our frequency table. In this window, StackCrunch allows the user to customize their Okay, so I just want to show you uh, how this worked. Let me X this out. So that was your YouTube. Now, if you want, browse search examples. Click on that. And there you have it. It gives you all of these by topic. So if you need help with box plots, dot plots, histograms, pie charts, scatter plots. Later on, statistics we do, they're all in here. These are in here and regression is here. So if you need help, and these are all videos. So for example, since we are in here, let me just look at uh, histograms or dot plots. And there you have it. You click on it, it talks about dot plots. Okay. In this video, you will learn to create dot plots using StackCrunch. Okay, good enough. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the other help option here you have is the documents there you go here again is a whole list of everything that you need um, so with graphics um, and let's say here's your bubble plot bar plot pie chart histogram let me go with the dot plots click on dot plots now you get the documentation and these are clickable so you click on them view an example here, creating a dot plot. We'll learn to create dot plots using StackCrunch. So it looks like we just watched that video, didn't we? So it looks like it's just different ways of getting you there. It's just now these are documented so you can actually read and then activate the video. Uh, next one, getting started, you can actually click on that and just watch this video. including calculating basic summary statistics okay you see that so please please do look at these don't rely on me going through StatCrunch and give you all the functionalities I will later on for every example or exercise that I do I will show you how it's done in StatCrunch because that's how I want you to do things and remember you you have access to StatCrunch on the homework as well as on the exams later on we're going to rely solely on stat crunch sometimes like when we go to ANOVA chapter later much later in about two and a half months two months um, I won't even show you the formulas and uh, when we go to regression for example I show you the formula but I'm not going to do it by hand it's just not practical and it's not efficient we seldom do things by hand in those topics so anyway you really want to learn stat crunch and here's how you learn it there you go i showed you all of these options youtube videos search examples and docs these three and you, you get more than what i could show you using stat crunch anyway let's move on so let's do uh the rest 
so I did a uh, pie chart bar chart uh, let's do for age age is quantitative we're gonna do histogram click on age and compute there you go this is the distribution of age notice it doesn't look good there are two gaps in here right two empty classes but well, I just took the default you can actually interact with it and you can change the, the colors you can actually um, change the the bins here bins are bars so right now let's say I have one two three four five six bins I can say store the bin looking at my low number is 15 right and it goes 15 to 20 let me look at this okay so it looks like I have a gap from 30 to 40 so I'm gonna go 15 uh, lowest 15 highest 45 let's do this I'm gonna start the bin at 10 the width we're gonna keep it at 10 and that's good enough remember I told you we can for lack of better word manipulate the shape of a histogram look at this histogram and look at what I'm gonna run huh. you see that I have two bars and this one and again um, we can make it different uh, much look much different edit I'm gonna start this at 14 and the width I'm gonna go 3 check this out you see that it looks different now so so there's your histogram our next uh, quantitative variable plot was a stem and leaf so I'm gonna go stem and leaf of age take the default and there you go look at that again that's what the stem and leaf looks like so leaf unit one and it shows you highs 42 44 right um, those are the high numbers for age and it just didn't use it because there's so many values missing between two and four it just says high numbers are those it didn't even actually use the stems because if it did it would have empty stems of three is missing so that's why it's doing it that way just take the default you don't have to mess around with this but the way you read this again one eight means eighteen one eight eight three eights so these are 18 18 18 and then you have a whole bunch of look at all the 19 year olds and then you have these 20 year olds right and there in large so you can see better me too look at all the 21 year olds majority of people there are going to be 21 year olds there you go and it tells you how to read it the variable of analysis is age decimal point is one digit to the right of the column okay uh, and leaf unit is one so this is like single digit 25 25 26 28 29 and then it jumps to 40 to 44 those were the outliers in the bar chart too okay so that's how you do your stem and leaf display okay and uh, let's see um, what next uh, okay oh, I need to shrink this don't I sorry okay uh, what did we do next oh dot plot let's do a dot plot of age take the default okay and I'm actually near the bottom here sorry there compute and here's your dot plot wow look at these these two outliers and notice what I just did I I, I boxed around them like that and stat crunch painted them in purple and uh, let me X out to look at in my spreadsheet that's 42 the other value is 44 those are the painted numbers cool so you can actually flag these uh, let me bring that back remember you slide to dot plot there it is again 
so if you leave these two out it looks like the distribution is skewed to the right the distribution of age is skewed to the right what else did we do we did that's about it with these right I think we are good that's all we wanted to do here and anything else let me pause the video see if I forgot anything else here we did oh let me go to tables remember we did frequency table so let's do a frequency table you go stat tables frequency let's do a frequency for uh, both of them in fact so I'm gonna click on age control click on sex and down here are the rest uh, the list of things that you can have I'm just gonna go frequency and relative frequency for our work and check this out and that nice so 18 we got three 18 year olds 10 19 year olds See, we knew there was a lot of a few of them and there you go so this is your frequency distribution 18 19 20 and so on this is the relative frequency the column on the right side the sum of all these decimals adds to one when it comes to variable sex there's 50 50 people in the sample uh, female 28 male 22 if you divide 28 by 50 you get 56 percent 22 by 50 gives you 44 percent okay so remember now uh, variable sex is qualitative because its values are female and male just because you have 28 22 doesn't mean that variable sex is quantitative these are just counts on qualitative variable we're talking about the nature of the variable the nature of that variable sex is qualitative okay and uh, that's that's what we want to mention so I think I think I'm good for now with stat crunch everything we did in chapter 2 we did in stat crunch also so um, uh, I think we're done with this chapter then let me go back to my note and uh, yes let me just go back up yeah looks like we're good so with this we're going to wrap up chapter 2 uh, if you need to please watch the video again just to make sure that uh, you're able to read some of the things that I have typed up that I may not have talked about okay and um, with that we're going to wrap up chapter 2